Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Five Steps to an Awesome Apache Cassandra Data Model, brought to you by Datastax. I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Patrick McFadden. Patrick is the VP of Developer Relations at Datastax, where he leads a team devoted to making users of Datastax products successful. He has also worked as Chief Evangelist for Apache Cassandra and consultant for Datastax, where he helped to build some of the largest and exciting deployments in production. Previous to Datastax, he was chief architect at Hobson's and an Oracle DBA developer for over 15 years. All right, so uh, I'm trying to distill this constant important topic into something a little more digestible with five steps. Of course, there's a lot to learn about data modeling, and I will tell you right now, this is probably the most important part of being a Cassandra developer is just understanding a data model. Connecting to the database using a driver, uh, writing code, all that is super important, but I bet that's not going to be your issue. The issue I always run into, and this is what I've, I've been doing for years, is just building the right data model for what uh, your use case needs and for how to build it so that it scales right. Um, there's just some very basic steps that you can follow. And I will tell you, this is meant for someone who's coming from a relational database background. I will claim right now, most relational database use cases can be run on Cassandra, including banking, by the way. Uh, and it's just down to the data model, how you work with it. And the big difference is in how uh, how the system works. It's a distributed system. It's not a single system. So there's a little different rule set. Um, but once you start getting it and working with it, it really makes sense. And it's really hard to go back to relational databases after this. So let's just get into that. Relational data models. This is what you know. Everybody knows relational data models, right? <clears throat> Which is surprising because I'm starting to get that answer is no. There's just a lot of new developers out there that have never used a relational database. But we're not there yet. We're not at this critical mass where people don't use relational databases. But as you know, relational data models are built on this idea of this normal forms. Um, you have multiple entity tables that are linked together using foreign keys, and then your query uses joins to bring that data together. The five normal forms. And you build it uh, based on something that we call an entity relationship diagram. And this is one that is for our uh, example or reference application called Killer Video. Now, interestingly enough, entity relationship di diagrams are not specific to relational databases. As a matter of fact, I can use this exact entity diagram to go and build any data model I need. It's just doing that, that translation. Now, this is, of course, very specific to Oracle right now because I used Oracle to build this. Uh, because it has foreign keys in it. So there's some concepts in relational databases that we need to get through. So relational modeling is, is creating the entity table, like a user table. Um, you create some constraints, add constraints to it, so you make sure you don't uh, stomp on new users when you create them. You index some fields so that you can do fast lookups on fields. And then you create another entity table, and then from there you can create foreign key constraints. And those foreign key relationships that you're building really help you build relational integrity. So this user has videos, you have videos have users. Um, and then there's a re referential integrity like this uh, on delete cascade, that sort of thing. And it's you're putting a lot of work on the database to do what, that for you, but it's a single database. Um, it's usually a single server. Yes, there are clustered type relational databases, but they are built on this concept that only one database can be doing most of the work. Um, and I will show you how Cassandra is 100% not that. And so the relational database modeling workflow is like this. You start out with your data, a lot of data, and you build models from it. So if you're trying to build a product or you know, you're trying to map some sort of uh, concept, you take that data, build models around it, and then you build your application. Usually the model is like an ERD, um, and use, in your application, you're using SQL to express that model. And <laughs> a lot of times that means doing joins and um, not a lot of straight database lookups. Sometimes you do a, a single key lookup, 
but a lot of times it's a, like a natural join or something that will bring data from various tables together. So how does Cassandra work? And this is the first big concept, okay? We start with an application in Cassandra. Now, Cassandra is an application database. So when we talk about building applications with Cassandra, that isn't just, well, it's great, you know, it's a great database for building applications. Really, you need to think about your application as you're building your data model as well. So in your application, you're building models that will support your application, the queries that you need to run your application. And then what will eventually happen is your data will fall into that. And the reason I have it inverted like this is because this is the workflow. Data will come after. You may have duplicate data in there. Um, that is that is a, uh, a thing with Cassandra that a lot of people have to get over first. It's like, oh, I might have duplicate data. Relational data models were originally designed to reduce the amount of duplication because at the time, disk space was not, exp not cheap. It was very expensive and almost hard to get. Um, <clears throat> you didn't get, you know, terabyte disks. You got a megabyte disk and you better use it wisely. We're not in that world anymore. We're more optimizing for speed and uptime than we are for how little of data I can store. So that's not a primary consideration for Cassandra. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, this application and this is a great place for you to go, killavideo.com. Um, it's a reference application. And the reason I want you to take a look at it is because there's this really cool tour on there that walks you through the data model. Like here's what it does. Uh, here's a feature on the website. Here's the actual data model. So this is an example. It helps you walk through how the data, uh, the data model supports the application. <clears throat> and it gives you a very comprehensive look at that. It's easy to work with and it, it's a more practical real world of example. Now I'm gonna use Killer Video. It's also on GitHub. Um, so you can download it, play with it, have fun with it. Um, there's Docker images out there. We have lots of ways you can consume it and play with it. Well, today in this webinar, I'm going to go through that and I'm gonna show some of the data models that are inside that and how we got to those data models. So time now for our first poll question. And uh, we are, um, that's up in your, uh, it should be up in the little um, control panel. You can see, um, you can see the question answer while I'm going along here. So let's start with the steps. I said there's five steps. <clears throat> the first one, and as you probably have guessed, uh, building the application workflow is that first step because of everything I've said is it's an application database. But what is an application workflow? And that is, um, that's not something, if you're coming from a relational database background, application workflows aren't something you just naturally, oh well, yeah, of course, that's where it is. <clears throat> because it is really, um, it's an important part of your application. And you may actually do it quite a bit during your application planning, but you don't think about it in terms of your database as much. But for uh, for Cassandra, this very critical step. So what does this do? Let's take a look. Oop, went backwards. So I'm gonna just walk through this real quick. The workflow, where is the workflow in this particular application? It, it starts becoming a lot more obvious when you actually look at what you're going to do. This is workflows are how does a user interact with my system? So, for instance, if I'm going to use a sign in, the user has to log in before I get really, I start involving a lot of the user base uh, parts of the database. And to get user based information, the first step is signing in. And so, whenever I get to see like a video, maybe that isn't so much a user-based interaction. So that's something that can be in a different workflow. So I'm gonna walk through um, real quick, like how this looks from a workflow planning stage. And so here are some of the application workflows in Killer Video. This is not all of them, but imagine you're doing like a whiteboarding session with your, your planning and you're, you're looking at, okay, how do, how do I walk through this application conceptually? And this has nothing to do with the database right now. It's really more about just planning out your application. So before I can show basic user about it, uh, basic information about a user, like their, their name and things like that, 
they have to log in first. We're not going to just show it. Um, now, there may be user profile information that we could show, say, um, if they posted a video. But uh, if someone is logged in, they sh that's when they should get like their email address, things like that. So they have to log in first. So the workflow is log into the site, then show basic information about a user. What you get in that workflow now is some clues of what data you'll have. And that's what we want to take. Now, there's some other ones here, like with videos. Like if we want to search for a show a video and its details, we want to be able to search for it first um, or have a list of videos. So we're thinking now about how the user information is presented in the application and then what kind of actions have to be done on the database. So number two, model your queries. <clears throat> and that's going to be based on number one. So I did say that entity relationship diagrams are not uh, stuck to one type of database technology. Now that ERD diagram I showed before, it was an ERD sort of because it had foreign key constraints built into the model. Um, this is a much more pure entity relationship diagram. It shows the entities, user, video, comment, and then the relationships that are there, and then the types of relationships that are there. So a user adds many videos. Okay. And there's properties that are associated with that. That's in the little ovals. And we can use this to map out some very interesting interactions, but also give us some relationships that have to be mapped as well. So these queries in killer video are there to support the workflows. So as we went through before, if someone use it, logs into a site, now we start pulling out well, what's the query that's going to be needed to support that. And we want to, since we use email as the user ID, we're going to want to find a user by email address to validate their password. And things like showing basic information about a user. Well, we're going to want to find that user by an ID. Now, you're not going to have an ID until you authenticate them and log them in when you find the user. So the workflow is intended to give you the, the, the enough information and the queries will do the lookup based on that information you found from the last query. So there's a cascade to this. Um, these, the reason we're going to do this will become obvious in a minute. But we're, what we're doing is we're trying to find the application-based queries based on the requirements of the application. And here's some of these that are there, like comments, we actually have a couple of different ways. To, there's two different views. There's comments by video, and there's also comments by user. So we now we're set up for duplicate data. Um, comments are in two places now, but there are ways to manage that. We also have things like searching, like finding a video by tag. Uh, wouldn't you just throw that in a search engine? Well, not really. That's not the fastest way to do it. And yet that means you have to maintain an index and things like that. There's faster ways, faster ways to do that with um, a really linear scaling database like Cassandra. And finding a video by ID, that's a straight up entity lookup. So now we're going to make the tables. We're see, we're already at step three. Isn't this easy? Um, well, you, once you map your application workflows, you find the queries. Now we're going to start creating tables to support those queries. So when you're looking at uh, going from a workflow to a table, there are some obvious things in here. We have entities, which is a single name, like user, comment, video. And those relationships are like a lookup table. And those relationships would be find comments by user. Now, a user has many comments and a video has many comments. We're, that's where we're mapping that relationship in a single table. And that's a lookup as well. So I'm going to walk through a couple of different table types. The static table, and I, I put that in quotes, it means that this is just a single entity table. Um, it's very basic. And here's an example of that. So a single lookup table is, is an entity for videos has a uh, all the information about a video that we need. Um, the key here is denormalization. Uh, yes, I could probably create, uh, in a relational database, I could create uh, different views of this data based on joins, like the preview thumbnails might be in one place, tags could be in another, but I'm denormalizing and putting all this data in one place. So how a table looks, or how you create one, is very simple, you have a table name, you have some column names, you have some column types. Now those types are built into Cassandra. And this is a good, a good place to pause. So there is, I have, I have to defend this a lot on Twitter because a lot of people think of Cassandra as a schema-less database. Oh no, 
there is schema and it is strict schema. There is a table with types and you can't just throw any data into the system. Other databases you can, sure. And there's a lot of key value databases out there. Document databases do this like Mongo and Cosmos. They have the ability to throw JSON into it without any particular schema. That's built for a specific use case. This is schema. So you should be able to map your use cases and your data. And this is really good for architects, I think, because now you're gonna be able to map the, the schema to what your use case is and enforce the types. And those types, let's talk about that. Um, the types are, there are many types in Cassandra. Um, many of them are similar, like varchar and text are very similar, but um, there's something missing on these and you'll notice, like for instance, an int or a text or a varchar, doesn't have a sizing. And yes, that is 100% true. It doesn't have sizing. Um, the sizing information that's in there, um, that is, I hate to say it's irrelevant, but it is fairly irrelevant because the way that the data is stored in the system, it allows up to two gigabytes of data per column type. And of course, that's constrained by the type itself. Like for instance, you couldn't put two gigabytes of an int in there because that's a 16-bit number, but um, there's also a varchar and uh, text that um, those are, you know, those usually you put like 255 behind a varchar, right? But yeah, you can store a lot in there. Now, where you would probably want to put, um, you know, like a bigger, or you'd want to use that bigger limit as something like a blob, that makes sense, but that two gigabyte limit is <laughs> not something you probably want to do because that means you're gonna to have to stream two gigabytes of data from your client into the server, and you're gonna create all kinds of weird problems just with your application. So it's a practical limit of less. Um, how much do you put in there? That's up to you, but not two gigabytes, trust me. That's, that's just too much. It's just gonna make your application get really upset. Now, next thing is, of course, the primary key. Primary key more or less means the same thing as a relational database. This is saying, this column is telling us what is the uh, unique part of this record. This creates a row of data in my table. So in this case, it's just one thing, it's a video ID. Should make sense, right? It's like, yeah, of course, one video, one video ID. There's no other thing that needs to be included in this table. And so that's why we call it static, is because it's really one video and that's it. There's nothing dynamic in here. However, we do have types in here that are dynamic like map and set, and I'll get to those uh, in a few minutes. Now the partition key, um, this is what we call that first value in a primary key, the partition key. And let's dig into that a little bit later, but just keep in mind that this is the terminology. Now a dynamic table versus a static table, and I get in trouble for the terminology. These are, I put it in quotes, so that makes it okay, right? If you put it in quotes, it's like, oh, you can say anything you want. But dynamic table is an official terminology. If you look at our docs, that doesn't say dynamic table, but I'm calling it that so you think about how it works. What you're doing is you're creating a table that has a variable amount of row data in it. So if I'm finding a video by a tag, um, I could have a tag like cat, you know, because there's a lot of cat videos on the internet, I heard, or data modeling or something like that. Um, you don't know how many different videos are going to be associated with that tag. All right, well, what makes this dynamic? Well, what makes it dynamic is the way the primary key is built. If you'll notice, we on the primary key, we have two different column types in there. And those two different column types right now are, um, we have a partition key and then a clustering column. The partition key is always the first item in a primary key, unless you in, uh, enclose it in parentheses or brackets depending on what you call it. But if you have um, multiple column names inside brackets as the first item, those would be combined for the partition key. The clustering column though, is a very special, interesting part of the way Cassandra works and has some magical properties, which I will describe in a minute. But when the primary key is set up in this way, um, it really makes the data model uh, faster and more interesting. It makes it that table somewhat dynamic as with row growth. Um, but uh, we'll get into that. Let's talk about that. So uh, users, for instance, um, if you have, and this is like, how do you get around a lookup? Well, 
if you recall with the relational database model, we had an index on email table, on an email column, and we just did a lookup that way. In this way, because we're mapping the application workflow, we actually have two tables. So we have a user credential table, which has the email password user ID. So when you give it an email and a password, it does a lookup. However, I know security people are gonna freak. It's not a plain text, you, whatever you want it to be there. It could be a blob, who knows? Um, but this, the user credentials are done with a lookup table. And then that ID is passed back to the application. And then in the next page, like a web app, it uses the user ID is known and you can use that to use look up the user with the primary key. All right, now we're gonna dig into the primary key. I warned you this is coming. Primary key is the most important part of a data model. Just gonna say that right now. So uh, if you were kind of paying attention before, now's the time to get crazy and really pay attention uh, because this is what's gonna make or break your data model. All right, everyone got that, right? <laughs> All right, so partition keys. Let's get into the elements. A partition key is on the primary key is this thing right here, this video ID. It's the first item in a primary key, always. And it has a very specific require or a very specific thing that it does in a, in a Cassandra cluster. Let me give you an idea of what it is. Um, this is an example of a thousand node cluster. Yes, there are thousand node clusters out there. Um, you probably use one every day, but um, yeah, there's a lot of Cassandra out there. But the locality, right, what do I mean by that? Well, when you're dealing with a really big cluster of, of data and you're trying to look up data, you don't want to go searching around the cluster for data. What the partition key does, and there, this goes down into the architecture of Cassandra, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover it lightly. Um, if you wanna know more, there's a lot more discussion about this on DataStacks Academy in one of our courses, but I'm gonna give you enough information right now to be dangerous. The partition key is how we figure out locality. And by that, what we do is we take the partition key, um, this guy, right, you know, this partition key right here, which is a UUID, um, wonderful number, 64-bit random number, and that partition key is hashed. And that hashing function, um, will always give you a consistent value out. So it's a consistent hashing algorithm. Uh, with Cassandra, we use Murmur3 or MD5. Now, each node in the cluster is responsible for a certain range of that huge 64-bit cluster value. And so it gives, um, it gives you an idea of where it is. So each node uh, in a thousand node cluster is storing one one thousandth of the data. And with replication, probably, uh, its neighbor's data as well. So about three one thousandths of the data. But what does that mean? That means that whenever I provide a partition key in my, in my select query, that's gonna let me know exactly what node that data exists at. And in a thousand node cluster, that's huge. Because you know when I was an Oracle DBA, we tried to get away from doing full table scans. Man, do not try a full cluster scan. That will take forever. So. This is how you get, this is like the zip code or the postcode or the address location of where that data is in your large cluster. So this is why we always say it's required. If you do not, if you do a select from videos and you just ask it for any partition key, you'll get a thousand records because that's the limit we put on that require on that. It's not something that you really want to do because you could have billions of partition keys like several billion. There are clusters out there with a lot of records in them. And of course, that's, that would be a mistake if you were trying to page through billions and billions of video ID or video records. So um, it's just a good thing and actually it's required to have a partition key. Now, what about that dynamic thing? So we'll just go back to that video by tag. So you know what partition key is all about. That's the location, that's where it is in the cluster. But what's this other thing, this clustering column? That is some cool magic. So we're going to take this partition key and a clustering column and break it down. So the partition key in this case may be a data model. That's the name of it. It gets hashed and turned into the row record or header for that record on disk. So a partition key gives me a location. I know what, what server I'm on. And the clustering column sets up this record after the header business on the disk. 
So it actually creates a single file with all of these records in sequential order. Now, a uh, clustering column could be, um, it could be a UUID, any of the, the types. How it sorts the data on disk is based on the CQL type. That's pretty critical, right? You could do some really fun tricks with this now because you're creating order on the disk for reads. You could order it by date, time, you know, the date time stamps. You can do it by integers. You could do it by UTF-8 collating order. Lots and lots of tricks. Um, I have plenty of them out there. Um, I'll, right now we're just going through the basics, but if you really want to get into some cool data models, knowing how to work with a clustering column will definitely make you an expert. All right, last step, using data types effectively. Now, I mentioned the primary key is the most important thing, and that's true. That will um, create a lot of trouble if you don't get it right. Now, data types, um, this is more just for your, uh, to make your application a lot more um, usable and gives you a better, a, bigger, a better leg up whenever you're building your application and building um, something that is easy to work with and also does a lot of really important marshalling of your data. So let's talk about that. Data marshalling, first important part of data types. Um, I, if I want to enforce user, any developer in the system to insert an int or a text or something like that, I need to put that as a data type. So if somebody tries to insert uh, some text into an int field, of course it's gonna stop them. That's what we want. That's why we enforce schema. Um, there are a lot of really interesting types in Cassandra. Uh, for instance, like an IP address is a type. So if you really want an IP address, which is used a lot, by the way, in IoT applications, then if someone starts to pass something besides an, I, an IP address, and that's IPv4 and 6, um, then it will stop them. It's also really critical for controlling order. And I mentioned that before with the clustering column. Um, controlling order is one of the biggest reasons we have types. So uh, whenever we're looking at something like this, like this video table, which has a lot of different types, you'll see that there are some some really important stuff but we did this is a static cable but um we have some really cool interesting types that we're going to talk about in a minute like collections so this is full schema use it wisely so controlling order so whenever you're using a clustering column there this is some rules and some things you know need to know about like integer varchar date timestamp those all have a natural order they you know when you're using it with a comparator of course, you know, one date timestamp is before another, and that's how it would sort it on disk. Um, but know that the default is ascending. You can, with, uh, there is a part of your data model, you can add this to your table, is override that sort order. So for instance, if you want to use a timestamp and make it descending, what you're basically doing is creating a reverse timestamp sort order on disk. So those are really handy for things like fraud detection, um, where you want to know the last five things that happened. Well, that's the first five things on that record. There's a special type, which I want to call out uh, specifically. It's called the time UUID. And uh, it may be obvious what it is, but it isn't obvious how it's done. Um, time UUID is a timestamp with a UUID component in there. And why would we do that? So you have a timestamp with some unique number attached to it. Well, a timestamp is... If you've ever worked with high resolution data, you know timestamps could really ruin your life uh, because you can't get enough resolution out of a computer. Um, once you start going below milliseconds into microseconds and even nanoseconds, the difference between one thing and another is very difficult, especially in a distributed application. Um, and the result is we usually, at timestamps um, by the ISO standard and Java, they stop at milliseconds. So what if you have something that happened and this is this is a 100% banking issue. What if you have a bank transaction that happens within the same millisecond? Well, you don't want to get to the point where you you can't resolve those two things. Time UID is the type the type you would use for that. So you would take that timestamp of the same exact same timestamp, um, cast it as your time UID, and then with, if both items are both the same time, you'll get two different things. And why? because that timestamp is combined with a UUID. So those two things will di have different UUIDs. Time UUID is an accepted standard as a UUID, it's a type four, and um, it's supported by every language uh, that's out there. If you support the UUID, it'll do a time UUID. 
And really what it's doing is instead of all 64 bits being UUID, it takes 32 bits for UUID and 32 bits for the timestamp and combines those together. What it gives you is that um, you could pull the timestamp out so you can ask for what time is stored in the time UUID. It also sorts, so the comparator works with that as well. It's just one of those really cool things in a distributed system that you should probably use a lot. Now, since uh, most of you are probably using Java, and this also applies to Python, but Python is a dynamically typed language. You could do whatever, right? But Java is not so much. Um, there, we have some some very important uh, types that are mapped, and ones that are not as easy. But if we do store a CQL type for those Java types, so like a float, a double, a decimal, big integer, variant, um, those do have Java types in them. Collections. Now, I saved the best for last. <laughs> the collections are one of the um, really powerful pieces of uh, of uh, of columns that you can, or the column types that you can create and use, but they have things you need to know about. So the the three the main ones, or the three collection types, and there there is two more, but I'm not going to cover those right now. The set, list, and map. That's all you need in the world, right? So what is the difference between these? A set is uh, probably the most commonly used and the one you do want to use the most. A set, um, it takes a, a type. So you have a, like for instance, my tags, I want to have a set. And the set means that it is variables. I'm, I can add dynamically add something to that set. So if I have uh, a video that has multiple tags and I add one more, it's a variable part of my static data model. Awesome. And it does create like that one-to-many relationship in denormalized data set. Wrap your head around that one. Um, the What's in the uh, greater than, less than brackets is the CQL type, and that's used for ordering. So if you have a set of tags and they're all UTF-8, it will uh, order the data inside that set by a UTF-8 correlating order. Now, list is very specific about how the ordering works. Yes, you include the type for marshalling, but when you add something to the list, it's you either append it or prepend it. It is order the order is specific to how you want it, so it enforces the ordering that the the user wants. Um, less used, of course, lists have a little more overhead because you're appending prepending, and this is not considered a CRDT. If you know about CRDTs, this is not a CRDT because of the ordering, but uh, set and map are. Map is the one that I want to really caution you. It is so easy. So maps, of course, are a key value that um, you have a key that could be that's contained in a type, like a CQL type, and then a value that's attached to that. And <laughs> it's really, um, I think, tempting to want to create a database inside of a database. Like, oh, I can do a key value database inside of my database. Um, there's a limit on maps, and there's a limit on all of these, actually. Uh, you can have up to 65,000 values, which is one of those numbers that seems pretty good, and that's a good size, but the reason, and that, that wasn't an arbitrary size. Um, of course, those of you who know integer math, um, you know, that sounds really familiar, 65,535, sounds familiar. But it's not just that. It's also the fact that <clears throat> the way that collections are stored in the system requires all of that data to get dumped into one place on the disk. And if you're going to read a map, it has to read the entire thing into the server. So if you have a massive map and you're reading one field, it has to read all that into memory, parse it, and send it back to the user. Um, yes, totally doable. And with computers as fast as they could be, it could be just fine. But just know that that is a variable on your query time. So something to consider. <clears throat> I generally like to have... Uh, a few hundred or less map objects just to keep things light and lively. But as with everything, if you need it in your data model, great. It is available up to 65,000 terms. And if it works for you and you've tested it and you're like, yeah, that's acceptable, the performance is acceptable, then great, go for it. Um, I'm just giving you all the warnings so you're well informed while you're creating your data model. But um, you know, this is just something that you can use to really great effect regardless. All right, and it's time for the second poll question. I've wrapped up a few things here. Um, this is, you hit all five. So there's a poll that should be popping up on your little control panel. Um, and you've just heard all five things. So we're, we want to know, like, wh what do you what do you think? Um, how did this do for you? Um, 
Now, uh, while you're answering those questions, the big question is, what are you going to do now? And I, I hope that um, this was a good teaser <laughs> for some of the things. Um, I see, I see a lot of you is like, I already learned this information. I'll bet you, you probably learned it on Datastax Academy, and that's great because um, we have lots of things out there for you. Um, now, if you're interested in Cassandra, there's different ways to get Cassandra. Of course, Cassandra is an open source project. So first thing is go to cassandra.apache.org, download the tarball, have at it. <clears throat> completely free, completely open. The source code is available to you. If you're feeling extra cool, you can go just clone, you can clone the GitHub repo, build it yourself. Um, that is part of what we are. We are a part of an open source project and that's fine. Now, if you want open source, but you really want support, because you know, this is what I always say is like, developers love support, their bosses love, or uh, developers love open source, but their bosses love support. <laughs> so if you're in one of those, those camps, we have that. Datastax distribution of Apache Cassandra, it's like Linux distro. Um, we bundle it up with a few things, but basically this is Apache Cassandra um, packaged up for you. And we have packages, RPMs and dev files you can use. And um, we have different support packages for that. You want really light support, like nine to five, or you want like 24 seven, we have that available. And if you need the full enterprise version, we have that in Datastax Enterprise. And Datastax Enterprise includes a lot of really compelling, interesting things for enterprises. For instance, security, lots and lots of security, because everybody loves security, not, um, but you got to have it. Um, there's also things that we include in there, like um, how we index our data with Solar. Um, we have attachments to Spark. Uh, we have our Kafka connectors. Um, we also have Datastax Enterprise Graph, our graph database, which is a totally different webinar. But if you want to understand or use graphs, we have lots of information out there for you to use on that. But I do, um, I do encourage you to go um, to Datastax Academy, academy.datastax.com. Um, you can get way more information. If you're interested in data modeling, there is DS220, which is our data modeling course. Uh, it'll take you a few days to go through, but it will give you everything you need to know. And of course, we have community.datastacks.com, um, our answer hub site, which gives us a, a place where you can ask questions. So there's a lot of things you can do out there. Um, and at this point, I think we're gonna go ahead and take questions. All right, I'm gonna switch off the screen here. Stop sharing, I think. All right, <clears throat> now let's take a look at some of these questions that, I, that have been out here. Um, I'm gonna scroll through a few of these. All right, first question I see here, <laughs> of course. Do you have to know your queries in advance but what if you make a mistake? Or you have to know your queries in advance, but what if you make a mistake? Great question. And now you're thinking, um, this is a common question. And uh, in a lot of times, you know, that you're going to make mistakes and that's that's okay. Um, you're, I always tell people, your first data model is probably not gonna be your last. And if you do it the, right the first time, there's probably, you know, you just miss something along the way. And that's just because if it's new, you're gonna be learning. And this is growth mindset, keep learning. But what happens when you make a mistake? Or maybe it's something where there's a, a new feature that's being added and you need to change some things. Anytime you have, if you need to update, like add columns to your table, no problem. Alter table, you could do it that way, it's very easy. If you need to change the primary key, and this is what's the big, the big difference and the big change is that when you change a primary key, you really have to have a new table. All right, how do you manage that? Well, if you need a new table, my suggestion is, is to create that new table with the new primary key, the new columns and everything that matches up with what, what the current table is. So you have table A, which is the old table, table B, which is the new updated primary key. Um, it's fairly easy to write data from one table to the other. Um, I, there's ways you could do it. Um, with Datastax, we have our bulk loader tool. Um, you can use Spark. Spark is a really cool way to move data from one table to the other. Or if it's not a lot of data, and actually it doesn't take that long. I mean, Cassandra can write millions of writes per second. It's, if, you, you, if you even have a billion records, it's only gonna take a few minutes. Just write some Python. And 
Um, I've done that several times too. But how do you manage it in the in the case of with an application that's online? Well, this is where if you're using something like microservices, um, you can do uh, an AB. So table A goes to microservice A, table B goes to microservice B. Important thing to know is that table data is item potent and immutable. So if you copy all the data over from table A to table B and then start doing parallel writes to both of those tables and you do another update write, it's not gonna overwrite any data and it won't throw any constraint violations. And then you can migrate over your application to table B without any downtime really. Um, it's a short answer for that, but um, that gives you some of the, the things you need to think about, but also ways to mitigate that. All right, let's see what else we have in here. Uh, what about performance in terms of inserting a new table to a cluster with a thousand nodes? Great question. Um, so this is inserting a new table, not records. Um, oh, no, nope, he updated it. Sorry, new record. <laughs> Let me answer both, actually. Um, so the if you're importing a new or if you're inserting a new table in a thousand node cluster, that's a schema change and that will get propagated throughout the, the cluster. It's actually a more relevant question than you knew. Um, it, dates, it does take a, a minute or so for that, that uh, change to get propagated, the schema to change if it's a thousand node cluster. Inserting a new record should not have any impact. And this is the linear scaling properties of Cassandra. Because the, the data that's getting inserted will always go to a primary node and its replicas. So if you have a replication factor of three, that means only three nodes in that thousand node cluster will be reading and writing that particular partition key. So that's how it scales. That's kind of the magic. And it's not magic, it's just computer science. But um, what you get by adding more nodes to a system is you spread the partition keys a lot more evenly throughout the cluster. Um, the result of that is, uh, and this is where a lot of uh, large scale Cassandra users are utilizing the larger clusters for, is you get a lot of parallel writes. If I have to write a thousand, if I have a thousand writers writing to different partition keys, that could potentially happen all at the same time. There's no collision, there's no coordination that needs to happen. So um, our driver, the data stacks, Java driver, Python driver, Node.js, C++, it's actually really smart about how it puts data into the cluster and optimizes for that. So there should be no hit at all. All right, um, let me look at some of these other ones. Is it ever appropriate to use a collection field for a primary key? You actually can't. And the reason, the reason being is because of how it writes data to the, it, how it writes data to the disk. It, whenever you're sorting, you can't have a dynamic, uh, something that's not frozen like that. And if you're writing to a set or a collect or a set list or map, um, making that part of the primary key would make your tables absolutely crazy. And so you can't use a primary key or a collection for a key on a primary key um, or a collection or a cluster column. Um, if you have that potential field of multiple fields, there are ways to do that. And it may be that you need to have more than one table as well. And this gets into some more advanced topics about data duplication and things like that. But this is where you would use something like a batch to keep all those tables synchronized. But um, definitely doable. And this is something that would be great, a great question on our community site if you were to ask it there. Um, let me see if there's any more questions on here. All right, so what happens if I run any, all right, so someone was uh, thinking about this is like an OLAP query. Like I do need to see every bit of data in a thousand node cluster. A, a great question. I mentioned this before, uh, Spark is a, uh, is a supported full cl first class citizen in the Cassandra ecosystem. Uh, Datastax has created a Spark connector since Spark was just a little, little, little thing like 1.0. And uh, it, it actually is interesting because the way Spark works and the way Cassandra works match pretty well in the way that it partitions data and how it distributes the, uh, whenever the DAG is created, for instance, our driver is very smart about where the partition keys and can parallelize that load really well. So in the large scale, uh, let's say that thousand node cluster again, um, we, we do have, users out there that are using Spark to do queries. Uh, example would be like, um, 
IoT data. IoT data generally has got a real-time component to it, but there's also a, a, a just as equally important analytics to that. Like I wanna see all the month's data and I wanna roll it up, that sort of thing. Spark is really used effectively. As a matter of fact, our DataStacks Enterprise um, includes a Spark uh, implementation. And we also allow external Spark runners to run as well. But that, that's how you do a massive OLAP query across the data. And it can run pretty quickly um, based on the way you're looking for data. Uh, there's some hints you can put in your queries or your Spark jobs to look for like particular partition keys or clustering columns. I mean, it's very aware of the table data. Um, and my favorite is using Spark SQL because it that means I don't have to write Scala. <laughs> but it works really well. Spark SQL works really well across Cassandra. All right, uh, let me see what else we got here. All right, so uh, follow-up questions for Sergey. Um, the, are they're not recalculated when their new record is inserted? No, okay, that, all right, I'm glad you asked that. So I, I think what you're asking is whenever you insert new data, does the partition key get like recalculated? And sort of yes, I mean, it's going to partition, it's going to hash that partition key, but because we use Murmur 3, it's consistent. It's a consistent hashing algorithm. So no matter where or when we ever use that, that data that goes into the Murmur 3 algorithm, it'll always output the same 64-bit number. Um, and that's, that's why consistent hashing algorithms are really well used in uh, like any distributed system is because it gives you that ability to do that sort of thing. All right, any more questions in here? Uh, all right, so one more question. Is there any way to restrict how many elements are in a data type, like a number or a string size? Um, not in Cassandra. Um, Cassandra does not restrict the, the sizing um, in the CQL type. Um, that's something that we could do at the driver level though. So for instance, you can, you can create constraints around the data types themselves, but um, for numbers, Numbers are going to be constrained by the type it is, so int or float or something like that. But string is probably, that's more of a, a thing that we do worry about, right? Because that could be a potentially a two gigabyte. Like, I'm going to upload a book into this column. You could do that. <laughs> you could create a varchar column and insert an entire book. Um, that's something that has to be marshaled pretty well on the, on the uh, application side. The database... Um, for a lot of reasons, is not going to try to stop you to do that. It's just not built into the, uh, the way Cassandra works. If you'll notice, there's a lot of things that are Cassandra optimizes for speed and efficiency and large scale uh, versus putting a lot of barriers in front of you. Um, and that's been, if you've spent any time on the Cassandra mailing list or in JIRAs, um, that, that's been kind of an ethos of the Cassandra project from the beginning. Um, and I think that's, it's definitely worth arguing about. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, there is a Slack channel for Cassandra on the ASF that if you would like to jump in and argue, I think there's probably some people that would just jump right in there. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the questions I have. Uh, we are at the end of the question and answer, and I think we're at the end of everything. And Billy, um, how are we doing? Doing great, Patrick. I have a few things I want to say, just a few thank yous. First off, I want to thank you, Patrick, for a great webinar today. I, don't, I would also like to thank today's sponsor, Datastats, for providing the audience with this webinar. And lastly, thank you to the audience. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.